Now at the end of the last tape we got to the point where we're ready to do the wing sheeting. Now what normally happens here is you wind up with a piece of sheeting and I want to get the, the same outline here that I use. You can copy it off the cardinal plans of course or what will soon be the Spitfire plans. But to make a long story short what I'd like to do is the Joe has already cut the pieces out but just go through the mechanics of cutting this piece out is I would lay the sheeting up here and I would plot where I wanted it to end with a pin run a pin down here and then trace this over here with a ruler so I wound up with five pins and then connect the dots of course leaving a little bit of extra material in the corner and what happens is then you you basically overcut it sand it to fit in that stuff I believe is and I think it's in real good detail on a wing construction video a same thing with actually putting the ribs which Joe did and I'm I'm giving Joe all the credit in the world here. he is <laughs> craftsmanship is unbelievable but all that information is on the wing construction jig plus that tape that we had when we went to his house so if you need either one of those just just get a hold of me and uh, choke me to death till I give it to you now this is the rough draft of the tsunami plans Pat Johnson of course is working on these feverishly Strago will be done, I hope, within some reasonable amount of time. And he's done, of course, a beautiful job. He's really captured the real essence of Tsunami. And it's real. It's one of the things we want to add to our inventory. For an example, if we want to build another Tsunami, or somebody else does, or we want to compare, the wing in Strago and Tsunami is uh, slightly different. Flaps are different. Some of the moment arms and little things, the uh, side areas are different. So. Having one set of all of these plans in inventory is always a big help. <laughs> of course, it's even better if you have the real tsunami sitting around with nothing to do. Anyway, we have our three air racers, and this is worth... I want to do a photo shoot. I'm going to try to get Jeff Stifel over here to do a photo shoot with the three air racers. These three comprise a, uh, a big part of the last, well not the last, but three years of my life to make these three guys. And I really feel it's a unique uh, collection of stuff. All three of these guys have been in the top five, all three in the front row. There's a message there. The message is, <laughs> drink Pepsi. So one of the things I'm supposed to be doing during the construction, this is unbelievable too. I had Joe take all pictures during construction and was saving them. Uh, obviously what we want to do is apply to model aviation. We already got the go-ahead to do an article. But what we want to do is rather than do an average article, we want to do a super duper article. So one of the things that we're trying to accomplish uh, is, is taking, I've got about four rolls of pictures taken during construction. And I'll just mention this, if you're going to do a construction article, you're going to have to submit photos what you want to do is during the construction itself you want to take plenty of photographs you're also going to need a decent set of plans Bob Martens is doing these plans he's been working with us since the very beginning so just some things to keep in mind and you can't take too many photographs you just believe me when I tell you they're, they're very fussy about the photographs so when I did the cardinal articles uh, they was more and more and more photographs so and I didn't have enough and they wound up not using any of them because they were terrible photographs Anyway, I'm trying to do a better job photograph-wise this time. I'm trying to get it from a lot of different angles, but again, we'll, we'll see. And I'll just go around. I'll show. Actually, I'm going to take, try to take one roll a week here until we actually finish this up. Now from the top angle, of course nothing is glued together yet, from the top angle you get an overall view of just how nice this wing is going to be. When it has the invasion stripes painted down the middle and the round dells and the finished, the absolute Joe Matamusco finish, this is going to be some model boy. This is really some project, turning out to be a good one. Now as with any piece, this is a pretty good fit. Anything you get from Joe is a good fit. I'm very impressed. And we wish him a speedy recovery. Okay. It's even a little bit on a tight side, so just about near perfect. Real nice.
So where's my slow? These two ribs I will not be able to get from where I sit here. And I'd like to catch that whole edge if I can. The rest I probably will be able to get with the thin. Again, getting this piece dry fit, pre-fit, whatever you want to call it, is obviously a big help. We'll just hold this in position while it dries. And once it kind of sets in there a little bit, what I want to do is start at one end and work the seam. Run the thin CA right down the seam, hold it tight. Wipe it with a bounty towel that kicks it off at a nice slow rate. Whoops, starting to kick already. Gives you just about the right amount of working time. This is really a, a, an excellent trick. And it doesn't leave all that CA on top of the surface, so then you have to go crazy block sanding it all down later. This will this will be relatively easy to sand down. And while I have it, I can get the other seam. You know, having two planes to make like this is, uh, it's a challenge, just to keep up the pace. Now we'll just wait till that kicks, then I'll flip it over. Now from inside, I can get down there and get each one. Go all along the inside with the CA. Plenty up by the hardwood spar, of course. Don't be cheap up by the spar. Up out onto the balsa. You notice this shape of the front sheeting, and that's been on many models. It's been on all of the Cardinals, but that's great because you don't get a stress riser. You get a nice, even distribution of the stress. It's a real nice touch, even if you put it into a nobler. Any plane, it doesn't matter. Of course, you can just let this run back and forth. Okay, just get a little view in there. Now we're going to get the, the top sheeting and just repeat the same thing on the top. Again, I always like to dry fit everything for sure. Now, some of the parts, which actually, which Joe did on his own here, and I don't have video of, of course, they're, they're, they're actually redundant, like making the tip weight box, making the inboard tip. It's very, very similar to the, uh, you know, the planes that we've built in the past. Actually, nothing has been too improvised here. We're trying to use all standard, proven stuff. We're not trying to get into that area of experimental stuff where maybe it will or maybe it won't fly. Now we'll just let this dry while I go get the phone. President Nixon always calls at a convenient time. It's really amazing how President Nixon can call right when your sheeting is drying. It's unbelievable. Anyway, most of doing the other side is just redundant. And I don't know how much we're going to get done in this session. The wife will be home, and I'm sure there's things to do like shopping tonight. But we're coming up on a nice weekend, and I hope I'm going to be able to get quite a few nice building sessions in here. Really psyched about this project. It's, it's hard to uh, describe to somebody who doesn't build models. You get a new project, it's like, I don't know, like a new girlfriend or something. Or boyfriend, as the case may be. Anyway kind of psyched about this guy trying to get all nice joints I don't want Joe criticizing my workmanship here he'll be criticizing it enough as it is the paper towel is a good tip that works every time I'll probably mention that enough times that nobody out there has to sand those ugly disgusting glue joints and you never want to hit a joint like this with kicker or you're dead you get popcorn try sanding out that popcorn forget it Okay, now I'm going to take this guy, since I haven't got the inside done, hit all the joints, 
so that the, the glue will run down onto the spar. Walk this, the glue out onto the spar. Now Joe did a very smart thing here in the fact that this quarter inch spar is ambroided right in place and I can see any spot where there's no ambroid, I'll just hit it with a little bit of CA. Throw a little kicker in there. And what I'll do is I'll do the other wing off camera so it doesn't get too redundant here. I can make a lot more speed when I don't have to videotape things of course. I can just, just aim that glue down there. I may even start to get some of the sheeting sanded out. Now I like to use the method of sanding a little bit each day. I don't know what method Joe likes, but speaking for myself, I like to, as I finish one assembly, I like to get it rough sanded out with say 320 or 400 so that I can see a little bit of progress each day. Okay. Okay. Alright, I'm going to come back to this after we do our grocery shopping for the week. Rest up a little and then we'll try to maybe even get the cap strips on one of these. What it is, I have both of them done. Now, where the hell's the other one? The other one's over there. All the sheeting is done on that one. This was a pretty good session. I got this one done off camera. I got one done off camera. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Yeah, it's funny. It's a difficult thing to work on two models at once. I mean, this is really like a juggling act. I don't know how to describe this. And then try to keep all the parts separated from what's the green wing and the blue wing. Anyway, I did get both of them to this point now, and I'll see you after a nice trip to the grocery store. Okay, I'm trying to, trying to figure out what I want to do next here. I have two of these wings, and I guess the next, the next step I want to do here is cap strip them. A couple of things about cap strips that will make your life a lot easier. You can use a stripper, and of course this is the master air screw. Everything we do around here is master air. You can strip off these. You absolutely should try to make the cap strips out of sea grain wood if you can. This way they don't start doing that and twisting. and Because once you get the silk span on there, you don't want to have to go back and fill in the gouges. So obviously Joe has made up a whole bunch of cap strips. And if there isn't enough, I have a couple pieces of sea grain. But for sure, you want to do the cap strips and sea grain. That's almost a must. Now I'm going to lay, it doesn't matter which one of these wings I do first. I haven't done any sanding yet. I'd like to get the cap strips all in place. And then I'll do a rough block sanding on the whole wing. So maybe I can get all the cap strips done tonight. I don't know. I'm lost in a time warp here. I did not envision how labor intensive a lot of this stuff was going to be in the beginning. And I figured it would just be, uh, you know, an hour or two here. But uh, I've gotten so excited about working on this that I can't wait to get down here in the morning or in the evening or, in the, or whatever I can. Thinking about this day and night. Adam Usko, you're making me crazy. Anyway, I'll try to get the cap strips on next and uh, I don't know. Maybe we can get both wings cap stripped today. Who knows? Who cares? No, I just check each one to see if there's a little blob of glue or anything out there. Couple of tips, couple of good ideas. Always start at the bottom. Now, because this wing is all 332nd, it's really nice. You have plenty of extra wood there should you screw up a little bit. And what I do, I just cut one in at a time. Cut them slightly oversized if possible, just a tad. You want to get the cap strip centered on the rib and 90 degrees if possible. Okay, once you do a dry fit, and that should stay in by itself, once you get a dry fit, again, when you're looking at doing two wings at once, it's, there's a lot of labor to this. This is kind of labor intensive. Okay, gives you a little working time to get this straightened up. You get both ends in and then press the middle down. Try to get them nice and even if you can. 
And usually by the end of the day, I have my hands all full of little drops of CA. It's terrible. And because it's 3.30 seconds, try to get them on straight. And we will block sand these all in, needless to say. Okay, now it's just a question of repeating that, how many times you have a rib here. And there are, has plenty of ribs and two wings. Just go right down this, one right after another. Now once you get the whole top layer on, the next thing you can do is flip the wing over and hold a wing in mid-air when you do it and hit the rib with thin CA. The reason you wouldn't want to do that right on a blanket here is you're going to pick up all the fuzz off the blanket. Again, make sure it's a little bit on a tight side. I'll do two of these on camera and then we'll, we can go to a little bit better, quicker system of showing this. But anyway, all these little tips and tricks and everything, I'm sure, you never know when you're going to pick up a trick or tip that's useful. I don't even know. I go with Joe K to other people's machine shops and I see the way other people work and how they organize their shop, their tools. I always come home with some kind of an idea that I didn't have before. It's always good and I always try to pass these ideas on. So if you have any, hey, pass them on, guys. is where that really pays off to have that paper towel. If you had to sand the big glob of this stuff on a cap strip, doesn't matter what, even old time planes have cap strips, you're screwed. Now with this wing tapers down here, there's kind of a reverse curve and I'm going to have to be real careful about not screwing that up, that's for sure. I know Joe's just looking for any excuse to kick my ass, criticize my workmanship. Anyway. All right, we'll do the rest of these off camera. We're just going to, and I, maybe even get both of them done in this work session. Who knows? Okay, now I want to have one side cap stripped here, one side not cap stripped. I just want to show this because the rest of it is just going to be redundant. I want to flip this over and I want to run a bead of thin CA. Let's get this on the macrons if we can. Inside on both sides of each rib so that I create an I beam. I also want to just dot the back of each one here, right down the whole length of the wing. I also want to get double the amount of glue inside around the gear block so that this sheeting is rock hard inside. Soaked with CA, soaked around here. It's already soaked up here. It gives you a big footprint of hard wood right around the gear blocks. Now this is whoops. Whoa. This is where it really helps. If you have that thin Teflon tube tip that I showed on the first video, you get right down each wing rib and of course around that gear block. Boy, that's where everything has to be rock hard. Let everything around that gear block be rock, rock hard. You probably don't have to do both sides of the ribs, but again, we're making, I'm making, and I'm sure Joe has the same thing in mind. I'm 50 years old, and I'd like to, uh, when I pass away, still have the Spitfire around if possible, or at least give them to Midgley or something. Anyway, I build for longevity. Okay, now that's one act, that's one side of eight sides that has to be cap stripped, so. Given the fact we have a lot to do, I'm just going to get right on with this. Hey, we got one whole side of one wing done. Obviously, yeah, redundancy city. Flip it over. Hit the reset button and start all over again. What a joy. One more wing on this side to do. Something you may be interested in, you know, if you're not one of the regular subscribers that gets all the tapes. This tape that's on the screen right now, making a copy for a guy that just started subscribing to the uh, Spitfire videos. 
and that had some interesting information actually when Joe was making the wings you can see one is in the jig and one isn't anyway not going to get a chance to finish this tonight the wife is calling and it's time I have one more wing to do I guess I'll have to finish this in the next session and I, I sure as heck don't want to rush it this is another good point you know what one of the things I always make is of time management yeah I would like to finish this but many times I've been tempted just rush 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 you know you drop the wing or you cut your finger or you something else and uh, I think I've had about enough fun for one night I have to finish this and then of course maybe in the next session get the whole other one and I'll do this off camera all this stuff is redundant now I get this all this cap stripping done and we'll be in fat city here maybe tomorrow or even the next day get to start sanding this out and get a look at what it's going to look like Hey, this has been a really good, hey, actually, we've been, all these sessions have been good. I really have been enjoying working on this plane. And it's amazing what happens is you get started on something like this and you eat, live, and drink, and I don't know what else. Think about it when you're sitting on the toilet. Anyway, I'm going to finish up what I can here. That's going to be it for this session, but... We're going to get back here and work on this later. And see, what I try to do, and I guess this is helpful, is I try to work on this a little bit in the morning. Go down and do whatever it is I have to do. Mow the grass at my two family houses, work at the machine shop, see George. Then I try to get back in in the afternoon, get a session before Karen comes home and starts to dominate my time. Take care of business and then come down in the, in the evening after supper and maybe even get an hour or two on this. And I know I've, uh, I've suggested to Midgley that's a good way to work. Try to get a little extra time that way, but uh, hey, whatever fits into your personal life. Now here's another little friendly tip I'm sure you can use. When you're done with a job like this where you're using CA, you almost always have it all over the tip of your fingers. At least I do anyway. And one of the things you might want to think about is get all that CA off your fingertips. Here's what's happened to me many times, is I want to start sanding this down and shaping it. And you have that glob of CA, and you do that, and you put gouges in the wood. So one of the things I'll do here is acetone will take it right off, even if you have to soak your fingertips in acetone. It's a good idea before you do any sanding operations. And I guess before I even sand this down, because this is getting toward the end of this little session, and before I can get back here, I want to radius these corners off with a Dremel tool. So I'll put the old Dremel sanding drum in and try to radius that in. And then I'll be, actually I'll be ready to start doing some block sanding. I like to do a little bit of block sanding as I go along. It'll just, it just breaks up the monotony. At some point in time you just get bored and sick and tired of working on this. And I'm pretty close to that point now. So I'll Dremel some of that off. I'll get the tool. That'll be one thing I can finish up tonight. This is the sanding drum that I I like the radius on this is what I've I've used this on many of the models before. Of course one of the choices you have if you want a smaller radius you could use that little drum that Uvi Degner thing that, that we showed on the previous video. That's a real handy tool also. But for now we'll do this. This will give us a nice even radius symmetrical on all sides. Now significant you can see how Joe has cut this and left a little corner there so we can work around that corner. That'll make it real easy. I can use this hand like an artist uses a, uh, a, cross, a cross piece. Put your hand on that.
You can just touch that with sandpaper. You want to be real careful because a lot of this is end grain. You want to keep a nice little uh, neat radius on there. Before I do any sanding on a wing, I want to get all of the, there's uh, obviously two wings, both sides, and I'll get these all, the rest of these done off, off camera. One wing down and one to go. Boy, this gets, <coughs> making a biplane here. Now we reached a nice little watershed here of having both of these things all radiused off, corners raised. Now what I did, I took an old sanding block and just glued it to make kind of a handle, make a T-bar out of it. What I always do is before you go sanding down cap strips, kill the edge. Now if you've never made one of these sanding blocks, all you need to do is contact cement some, in this case it's 220. Find a nice smooth piece of wood, preferably the old hard balsa that you don't use on construction. Radius the edges, you can see there's even a sanding joint in here. And one of the things, well I can get this one out of the way. One of the things I want to do is starting in the middle, try to pick up, now you don't, sure as heck don't want to go this way, you want to kind of go back and forth. And just pick up whatever high spots you, you can. This is just a rough sanding now, this is with 220. Now what I'm trying to do is get rid of all the corners, all the edges at this point in time. Now because this is 332nd wood, it's nice and stiff, number one. Oh boy, that's nice. And it's best if you can go front to back, front to back. Now if you really have a rough, this is not rough, this is, this is, on the verge of being beautiful right now. If this is rough, you can put colored chalk out on here and then just sand off all the colored chalk. The colored chalk will act like silver and show you the high spots. Now, because there's very little glue sticking up here, this is not a big time consuming job. And of course, Best to do one panel at a time. We have four surfaces on each wing and two wings to do so. A lot of this will just get to be time consuming. Another thing too is never sand when you're tired at night. Late at night is a bad time to sand. I find myself, when I get tired I try to rush. When you rush you break cap strips, you break the sheeting. You just get clumsy. So a lot of times if you're tired at the end of the day, which is the case right now, I'm going to do a little bit of the block sanding now, but I'm certainly not going to try to finish it. I'll come back tomorrow and work on this for a while. Again, I want each, each wing panel so that I can rub my hand here and I can't feel the transition between a cap strip and the sheeting. Each one of these before I move on to the next panel. Now I'll make up several other of these blocks. I'll make one up with 320, maybe one with 400 so I can really get a nice Nice transition in on this. But remember, this is the rough sanding. The final sanding we'll all do with little edge blocks. Just get this roughed in. And... Now using this method, you can really pick up any little imperfections. You can actually go through one cap strip at a time. I can feel a little bit of glue there. And any time you spend right now is going to be just just an infinite amount of time more that you'll save by not having to go back and sand out all the lumps in the filler and trying to fill things in with talc and all the, add all that weight. 
You really need to get everything just about perfect right now before you go on to the next step. Even that joint in the sheeting where the sheeting joins the center sheeting, you can work that out. Oh yes, yes. And that's the whole idea of having that, the paper towel or the Q-tips kick the, the CA. You don't have a whole lot to do sanding these joints out. Keep the sanding to a minimum. And this is just one of those labor-intensive, time-consuming parts of the job. We're obviously not going to finish this in this sitting, but we'll do, well, as much as I can. May even get one surface sanded out, but you can't do this, I can't do this kind of work when I'm tired. Once I get tired, it's, you know, it's, I'm gone. That's what happens when you're 50 years old. Wear and tear on your body here. Now I want to even get this center joint while I have it here roughed out. Again, as I do, I just go back over when, the, when I can't feel the joint anymore. I kind of feel like then I'm sneaking up on it. And of course, every step of the way here, you're removing extra material that's probably just going to go along for the ride anyway, so... Right, that, that seam is perfect now. Now let's go down here and work on this one. Again, it gets a little tricky out by the tips because you have reverse curves and reverse angles and everything, but... And it's good if you can make up eight or ten of these sanding blocks all in one sitting and then you'll have enough to do the whole plane. What will typically happen when you want to get the sandpaper off, put it in the oven, warm it up at 100 degrees, the paper will peel off and put new paper on. Oh, yes. Oh! You get the idea here that this, you, you just can't feel the joints. When you're happy that you can't feel the joints, then you can stop with the block and consider that rough sanded out. And from this point on, we'll be using all 400 probably and get that nice velvety smooth finish. But first you have to get all the shapes right. You can't really shape anything with 400. You have to do the shaping with 220 or 320 and then do the final, almost like, let's call it buffing out with the smoother grit. Now out here there's, you can see how this is. It's like a reverse polywog curve out at the tip. I'm gonna have to do this by hand or maybe with a foam block. I'll have to have to think about that yet. But I really have, I'm gonna work on this and I won't do a whole lot of this Tonight, I'm getting tired. I'll come back tomorrow and work on this. Right now, I'm a dead man. Now, let me just show this on the video. I get things like this from time to time. Andre Trudeau of Canada was down here with a bunch of his friends, and we had a great old time at the Sun Forum last year. His daughter is uh, stationed here, and she's in the... I'm, I'm not sure I understand in the UN and she's in Yugoslavia now, but they sent me this nice t-shirt and I'm glad he thinks I'm uh, <laughs> Glad he thinks I'm a lodge Andre if I was a lodge believe me. I'd be having love affairs on the side cheating on my wife Forget it. I'm an XL anyway. I appreciate it and believe me This is one of the things that makes you, know, you laugh all you want one of the things that makes the involvement you have with other people all over the world worthwhile in this hobby is just getting nice little surprises like this. I really, I really thought it was a letter bomb, though. Canadian letter bomb. Thanks a lot, Andre. Now, today in the shop, I only have about an hour here, but it's one of the good points I thought I'd make on the video. From time to time, I'll get an hour. See, the family is busy doing bullshit now, cutting pumpkins or something up there. 
so I can sneak in an hour of work on a plane. So what's good to do on a time when you only have a short amount of time, and this is one of those times. You only have, oh, I don't even think I have an hour. But I can use this time to good advantage. Well, I can sand. Sanding, you can start and stop any time, and we're in the middle of sanding out one of these wings. But what you can't do in a short amount of time, and this is a good point to make, it's hard like right now to make up a push rod, install a wing tip, something where it requires a thought process. But sanding, you can just relax and sand. See, I can just sit here and sand for an hour, watch TV, listen to the radio, make a phone call, whatever, and get something accomplished because it's that long amount of time. If I sit down and try to do this all in one sitting, I'll probably be bored. But for an hour, I'm not going to be bored. So while I'm sitting around here today, I'll see, maybe I can even get an hour and a half. And the family's up there making skeleton pumpkins or whatever. They sure don't need me to make pumpkins. Anyway, I got some of this sanding out the other day. I'll try to work on the other end. I get the bottom. If I even if I can get Joe's wing done today, I can at least put his aside and I can start installing the tips and things like that that are more fun. The object that, at least for me, is there's so much sanding to do that I really don't like to try to do it all in one sitting. I get impatient, I want to rush it, I want to get through, I want to get on with it. But if I do an hour today, an hour tomorrow morning, an hour tomorrow in the evening, I'll break it up, I'll watch Monday Night Football, uh, watch whatever. It goes quickly, but it's terrible if you have to just sit down and sand and sand and sand for four hours and breathe the dust. It makes you crazy. So one of the things I'm going to do, I got my big sanding block from yesterday for all the flat airs. I need to dig into this sanding box. Well, maybe I'll have to even make one up here. I had one from last year. I had a real nice, here it is. I had a nice little one that has a little bit of a, a relieved angle. It's not 90, it's about uh, maybe 120. And what that allows me to do is take just, I can get into corners with this. Now where I have this reverse curve, I'm gonna have to be sanding in here. I can't, obviously can't use the big block. Around these corners and tips, I need to get in. Up around the push, I don't have the push rod hole even open yet, but again, it's just a great idea. If you can do an hour at a time, at least for me, it's a lot easier to get an hour at a time. Now one thing that's real helpful, I took the back piece of a foam wing here and I'm going to try to make up some blocks. I want to sand this reverse curve. Again, I'm just rough sanding. This is not, I don't even have the wing tips on here, but I want to get as many of the joints smooth as I can. The big block is handy. My little counter, counter angled block a little piece here with a tips join. Obviously this is a more complex wing to work on say than a nobler or a normal uh, straight line stunner. I want to get perfect transitions at this point. And it's so nice when you don't have to sand through all that hard CA. It just makes it a lot easier. Preparing the wing at this point in time, now see back here I can use a hard block. I can use the block with the little relief on it. Any of the sanding you do now, you'll probably save 10 times the amount of time later on, but you're not going to have to sand 100 coats of filler to fill in a gouge if you sand it until it's perfectly smooth right now. And again, this is with the rough paper. This is not even, I'm not even going to try to use, this is all 220. Get all the surfaces flat, get rid of all the glue joints. This is where a lot of people just kind of miss the boat. They want to run on to the next step right away. Then I want to take each one of these just like I did on the other piece. Any little, any little imperfection I can get rid of right now is the time to do it. Now another important point at this point in time is not to leave the back edge of the trailing edge a razor blade. If you radius it a little bit you'll find you don't buff through the corner and the tissue will stick a lot better. 
So I, with the big block, I did this, I don't know if I did it off camera while we we're on the other lens, but just getting a nice, a nice smooth radius there that you can buff that line without breaking through the paint. Right now is a good time to get that, that radius in there. And you first do it with the big block and then transition into a small block. Now another technique, and you really have to develop this technique, is by hand. Now right here I can feel I have a high spot. You can't see the, oh there's a bad one there. You can't see high spots when you're doing rough sanding. It's almost impossible, right here we have a bad spot. So I'm going to do this by hand. And I want to get one panel at a time to where it's almost perfect. And just with your hands, your hands are much better. You almost could sand this out in the dark. Don't fool yourself into thinking, oh boy, that looks good. When you paint this, put dope on it, and then have to sand it, you've doubled up the work. So before I even edge the cap strips off, I want to get everything smooth to the hand. And I can feel little imperfections right there. And as you find them, take care of them. Now, just a good example of this, I have the small block. The seam here is just a little less than perfect. Now just knowing which block to use is a big help. Okay, now the one here is, is a really, this is probably the worst one on the whole wing here. And I'll just try to transition this down. I guess the biggest single pro problem I guess people have is at this point in time they don't want to spend the time sanding. They want to get on with it and get dope on it. And If this isn't perfectly smooth, when you put the first coat of dope on, you're going to put extra weight, unnecessary weight. It's going to be heavier and not look as nice as if you pay the price right now. Right now is a good time to pay the price. Pay the price and be done with it. Oh yes, yes. And you can see, all of this material that's coming off, this is not going along for all eternity. This will not be on the airplane. So I'm just going to pick away at this in the rest of the time that I have to do tonight to try to, maybe I'll even get one, I don't know how much more I'm going to get, but at least get some part of this wing up to the point where I'm happy with it. Now I've got a couple of spots here I'm going to need a little speck of dap. Little spots that, they're low spots in the wood that I'm trying to sand out but I don't want to make the sheeting any thinner. By the way, don't get the idea you need to buy a, 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 a gallon pail of this. The smallest container you can buy is the best. Believe me, the only reason I have that is because I'm doing construction work. Now, there's a couple little low spots. Before I transition to the other side of the wing, I want to find all the little low spots. And I can kind of fill them in now. This way, this can be drying once I flip this over. Again, if you do this in an, on an ongoing basis, it just seems like it goes a lot quicker and uh, more pleasant anyway look it all over any spots the earlier you can start filling these the better this one I want to sand some more sooner you can get on with it the better and always leave a little bit of water take take your hand and sprinkle it on top of the dap that'll keep it whatever you want to call uh, more usable it won't dry out and you'll get all those chunky flakes on it Now, just a couple of thoughts here. You would like to keep, obviously, if we lived in an all-perfect world, if trees grew straight and if you never made a little gouge with your fingernail or a wedding ring or something, in an all-perfect world, you wouldn't need any dap. And the object is to keep the dap to a minimum. Absolute minimum. Never use it around fillets if you can help it. It doesn't really make for any kind of strength. It's just a cosmetic 
uh, for filling in on things where there really would be little or no strength involved anyway. Now in a couple of these spots, you, can, I, I just, you can't show it on camera, there's just a low spot here that I can't, I don't want to sand the sheeting any thinner, so what I'll do is just touch it with the dap and quit while I'm ahead. And what'll happen as soon as I hit this with dope, it'll expand the wood and I'll have to re-block sand this all out anyway. So. Now after, <clears throat> after I get most of this, and, I, and I'm real happy with this by the way, I want to take the big flat block again and just go over each cap strip and make sure I haven't left a nice and slow, make sure I haven't left a ridge and edge or whatever from the little sanding block. I can do each one individually. I almost never get through with a plane without doing this at least once and breaking up some cap strips, so don't think you're any different. Again, it's just that thing of patience at this point in time. You know, if you want to know what separates the people with 7-ounce finishes from the ones with 15-ounce decoupage, usually it's right now at this point in the construction to get all the sanding surfaces flat, all the joints flat. Just so important to get everything flat. Break all the edges down. Don't want any 90-degree edges on here that are going to pop up. Now we'll wait till the very end of sanding a wing. I'll flip this over before I radius all these edges, and that's a tr that's a whole dissertation in itself. I don't think I'll have time tonight to even start that. I'll feel real happy if I can get one of these wings done by tonight. This one still has a little funky spot. I just can't. I don't know. Using your fingers, your fingers always tell you what the story is. Stevie Wonder would probably make a great finisher. Again, I don't want to get this all super thin, but right now it's the hand that finds it. Get used to using your hand to find mistakes, and when you do, you'll be light years ahead of trying to do this uh, in some other way by looking at it. You really can't look at it and make any real progress, any meaningful progress. Okay, this is ready to flip over, and I'll start. Obviously, I can skip doing this on camera. I can... Uh, the only difference will be I'll do around the gear blocks and then try to edge them all off nice. Just trying to look around here and see. Take care of all these joints and edges and then probably tomorrow I'll come back and do all the all the radius edges or start on the other wing. Try to get both of them done. Now just, I guess worthy of mention, I just want to put this on a video. Anytime you're doing an I-beamer you could do it the same way of course. Because this is an elliptical wing, it's really difficult. You don't get the same, we're not trying to do exactly the same thing. This wing has a constant curve. But if this were a nobler wing, we could, we could almost make one block from tip to tip. The other point is around the gear blocks, with the bolts holding the gear blocks right in place, you get a perfect transition. When we start getting the final sanding on this, those gear blocks should be absolutely perfect. Just takes a little patience. This is, I just, I, you know I repeat that too often, but the thing I find out in trying to help people do things is they'll come down to shop and say, ah, I, I want to sand this whole plane out in 15 minutes and start painting it. Well, you know, then it's going to look like you did it with a mop. Right now, if you're striving for excellence, it just takes time. And you got to do, I guess what I'm doing, the point to make on this is take your time, do one surface at a time, don't settle for second best. And don't move on to the next step until you finish this step. If you do it one step at a time and never go to step two, what happens if you get involved in three steps and making a body and a wing and a tail? And it, What happens? You come down and you don't even know what you want to start first. So I find it more successful for me if I stick with one job until it's in that I'm happy with it. Now what's nice is while we had the bottom all sanded out, the dap is dried, and I can just take a block, very carefully and slowly dust it off. Now the other thing I want to do is, this, this airfoil and this wing has a lot of sharp edges. I always like to take some thin CA to the edges. Perfect. 
Always like to take some thin CA to the edges at this point in time and just first radius everything. Make sure it's radius. Even though we don't have the final shape on here, I don't want to just beat this all up to hell. So take some thin CA, lay it right on there, and let it let it dry out by itself. Rub it with a paper towel if you have to, and it'll harden up the edge, the leading edge too. Now just just that edge. It'll just give me a little bit better working surface. Otherwise, all these soft edges, every time you touch them or hit a belt buckle or a button, you wind up putting a ding in them. Of course, the last thing, just wipe anything that hasn't already kicked. Now one of the things that's a handy tip, if you're sanding, and I'm sanding on a double old blanket here, there's two blankets, one on top of the other. What's real handy now is I can take this, I'm almost at the end of this session, take this blanket outside and just shake it out and get rid of 90% of the dust. Plus the other 10% you wind up breathing no matter what you do. When I'm not working on a video, I try to do it over the dust bench, but I can't video over there conveniently. There's just not enough room. Now, the leading edge, too. Once I have the leading edge radius, the shape that I want it, it's nice to be able to harden it up. This also gets into the glue joint, hardens up the glue joint. And never, never hold the thing in place or else you glue the paper towel. Keep the towel moving whenever it's on the wood. Same thing, whoops, just glued it to the table. Same thing in this position. No matter whether it's a tail, a wing, stab, fuselage, top block, anything that's an edge is going to take an extra amount of beating. And what this does, it turns the leading edge into about 30 pound balsa. It gives you a little chance that you're going to wind up. Another thing with Strega, if you go over and look at Strega, you notice all the edges withstood the whole first season with clumsy launches and whatever else. Really withstood the test of time real well, thanks to this little bit of effort. Plus, once it fully dries, you can just run a little bit of sandpaper down there, gets off all the little doodots. So I'm hoping this has given you some thoughts and ideas of how to sand easier, quicker, cheaper, friendlier, whatever. Sometimes you just have to see it once and you can run right out and duplicate it. Now when we put the final cut on all these edges, the final little edge, then I'll put two or three coats of CA on there before I actually put dope on. In the meantime, that'll harden it up, I hope enough that uh, just won't be beaten and battering it. Battered wife syndrome, battered edge syndrome here. All right, that's about all we're gonna get done. I can see that this is over. We may get back to this later. Anyway, I'll get back. The other wing is next with one in the bank. Actually, I'm satisfied with that. Now we'll work on that one next time. This one's finished, and we'll be back next time we get to do a session. We hope we can get the other wing done, maybe. And today, what I'd like to accomplish, I have the first wing all sanded out, sitting over there. Beautiful. Now, one of the other things I thought about doing was trying to finish one wing up to the point where it was ready for tissue. So the Joe could take it home and I decided I'll have enough time this week. Work schedule is going to be light. I'll get a lot of sessions in. I wanted to try to get both of them ready to get the tissue on. I figured that would be a, a legitimate good goal for this week. Anyway, what I'm going to try to do, I'll sand this wing out exactly the same way off camera unless I come up with some other little tip or something I think you can use. Okay, the other thing I wanted to, uh, to try to organize in my own mind now, as soon as I finish sanding this, I want to do all the cap strip edges and maybe later on today I'll get to do that. I don't know how long this is going to take, a couple hours or whatever. 
But the most important thing is I don't want to skip steps now and then have to go back later and do this. I really want to go one step at a time, bring both wings up exactly equal into uh, the same state so that when Joe actually comes to pick his wing, he can just pick one or the other. There won't be one a lot nicer or lighter or whatever. And actually, things are coming out so nice, I don't think it would matter. But when I get to the point of doing the edges on the cap strips, I'll, I'll try to do that up on a macro lens so you can see. That's probably one of the things a lot of people have uh, asked me over the years, please give me a little hint or a help or tip or whatever. That's one of the areas where even top level builders get those little edges where you buff through on a cap strip so the, the tissue rips or you get wrinkles or whatever. So that's one of the things, and I'm trying to plot this out in my mind today. Because what will happen, and this is a tip you might want to use, is while you're doing a redundant three or four hour sanding job here, well, you could be daydreaming. You could be thinking about what's the next step, how do I want to do this, where do I want the finish on this to go. Uh, I'm just looking at it, trying to do the same thing. Because obviously this is part of getting the plane to the next, the next level, getting it up from the level of it's just a redundant thing to the last one you built. You'd like each one to get just a little bit nicer, lighter, better, whatever. So anyway, without further ado, and uh, I'm going to try to sand this whole wing loop, get it all done, see how much I can get done, and then get on with radius and all those cap strips out, and may even get that done today. Now one of the <clears throat> one of the tools you might want to have, and I, I don't remember putting this on a video before, this is a machinist ruler, and what I've done is glue that sticky back sandpaper to the back of it, and the reason you need that Whenever you have an edge of a flap here, you're going to want to radius this corner and this corner. And what they do is they come together. If you just sand this edge and this edge, you get kind of an ugly corner. So this is almost like making a picture frame is to get in, and you really need something like with a steel edge to get in there. This seems to work better than any of the other sanding blocks I've had. At least for right now, you want to start to maintain that edge. only takes a couple of swipes with the paper. Let me show that up close. You need to at least rough that corner out so it comes to a point. If you leave the material in this corner, you get really a sloppy edge. In other words, that radius on a trailing edge has to continue. This a little slight radius has to continue. Now, as soon as you get the radius in there and you're satisfied with it, it's a good idea to get some CA and Q-tips, put it on that edge. Like we did previously, we did the whole edge of the wing here, the leading edge, and in here. I'm not going to do the trailing edge because I don't have the flap, the uh, the flap hinges cut yet, the hinge pockets. But getting all these edges radiused, number one a radius, and number two get some thin CA so they maintain their integrity. They don't start every time you touch it or into a blanket or something, you wind up with a uh, a little problem there. Now this might be a good point to mention. I need to take a break from all this sanding. One of the one of the things people make mistakes on is they take a sheet of raw wood. Okay, in this case it's 332nd. Block sand it down to whatever dimension. And if you look at this at a microscopic level, this is what it probably looks like. And I think this is all on a finishing video. At a microscopic level, they never block sand it down smooth. So what happens when you go to put on your dope and your tissue and everything, you basically wind up filling all this in with either dope tissue or combination of silver dope tissue or whatever. Now if you were to, and, and of course in an all perfect world you'd get it as flat as a piece of glass, you'd only have oh man maybe a third the amount of finish on the plane and this is one of the secrets you know when you think about secrets so you say well how does Billy Warwich keep his plane to 50 ounces and I build the same plane and it's 62 well this is one of the reasons is early on in the finish where we are right now to get the wood perfectly flat if you keep these two pictures in your mind I think you'll have an incredible insight into how to do finishing now, there's always the two, the two choices that you have with rough wood. You have a piece of rough wood, and it doesn't even have to be rough. Rough means the way it comes off the sheeting. You can fill in the valleys, 
and that's always the easiest way is just plaster on dope, talc, whatever. And the hard way is to spend hour after hour after hour, which is what I've been doing. In fact, I've been spending day after day to get flat surfaces, so I need the minimum amount of material on here to get a nice, shiny, reflective surface. And remember, what you really need is to have it flat so that light reflects off it. When light comes down and light bounces off, that's where you get that incredible shine that you look at some people's finishes and you just, they buff out beautiful. You can't buff out a finish that's like this. Well, you can't buff out a finish that the top of it is, is in a microscopic level like overspray. That's why overspray, the light starts bouncing in every direction and you can't, it just looks dull. Lacquer, dope, when it's buffed properly, the light hits and goes back up. So we're paying the price right now. And if you can picture this in your mind, the flatter you can make the raw wood, the less of this nonsense you're going to have later on. Now, what will usually happen, and I'll make a, uh, let's see, I can make a good example of how this happens later on. What most people tend to do, so here you start out, and you, you obviously block sand down where you need very little filler. The first coat of dope comes along, you get a good wet coat on, and what happens is you get a little bit of swelling. So now what happens is after this wood is swelled, you need to go back and kind of knock the mountaintops, not really a lot, but knock the mountaintops down. Now you have a piece of wood that's been swelled and it's black block sanded down. I know this sounds very time consuming, but when you want a seven ounce finish, this is what you have to pay the price now. The price has to be paid now if you really want this. Once it's swelled and it's block sanded, the next coat, it'll swell just oh, ever so little. Boop, one hit of the paper. And about the third time, you'll have all the wood cells in position. It'll stay flat, and then you're ready to lay out tissue. And what you'll have is that one that finished it isn't thick in spots and thin, thick and thin. And here the thing starts blistering and bubbling, and you put it out in the sun, and it's all shifty and everything. It's one just almost as if you had monocoated the plane, one thickness throughout. And this takes... It takes time. It just takes time. It isn't really the, the, the high skill level thing. It's time consuming. So if you're willing to pay the time now, you'll save a lot of time later on. And I'll probably spend the rest of this, this session just sanding away. Now I've just been closing it. You can see how much dust is on a table here. There's probably as much dust on a table as in my lungs. And just finishing up the second of the wings, and I'm trying to be even fussier on this one, getting each, each area, each surface as flat and true as I possibly can, because the next step I want to go on to is I want to radius all, all of the open bay areas, I want to do that in one stroke at a pen if I can, while I have the shop all sloppy like this. I want to get all these edges done. And it's amazing how the, the second wing will even go quicker than the first one, but it's still very time consuming. But boy, does it ever pay further down the road. Now before I go on to the next step, I always check each cap strip joint. Anyone that isn't really up to your standard. Had a couple little spots where the dap was dry in here. Where the hell am I? That's dry. I can sand it out. Then I'll take the CA, do the edges, and I'll get ready to do those all those open bays. Actually, now when you get this much dust on a table, obviously I'll take this blanket outside, beat it against the tree, and uh, <coughs> breathe deep. Oh God. Now it's the end of the morning session, and this is what I, I love to do. Just kill the blank. I got my favorite tree.
more of that dust you can get outside, the better. Now it's the end of my what's going to be my morning session here. I'm gonna go out, go to work, run down a machine shop, try to make some money, believe it or not. Maybe we'll get back in the shop tonight or this afternoon, depending on how the day goes. But one of the things that why I'm doing this, I'm putting this on a tape, is it's a good idea at the end of every session or every every day, whatever. Get that dust out of the shop. Clean it up. Don't breathe any more of that than you have to. Believe me. It's a good idea. Lose the dust. Okay, we have both wings sanded out. Tonight we get back in the shop. I'll start working on the cap strip edges. Boy, I'll tell you, they're starting to shape up. This is when it starts to get to be a fun project. See you later. Now tonight I want to do one of the things at least I hope I can get done is all of the radius edges. And what I need is some of this sticky back sandpaper and I notice Jimmy's been buying this for us. We're, we're kind of out of it but it's sticky back paper. I need to make up a little sanding tool for the corners. If you don't have sticky back paper obviously one of the choices you have you can uh, substitute some contact cement. In fact, we may have to substitute it here because this paper's already been st stuck to something else and it isn't very sticky anymore. But you can just roll this up around a piece of old brass tubing, a dowel, piece of broomstick, an old toon pipe. Hey, anything. Get it sticky. Clip off the piece you don't need. There's nothing, there's nothing secret about this. You can make yourself up these little tools. If you don't have which I don't have now is any sticky back paper that's really new. I'll wrap this around. This is just a makeshift thing. Get me through the session. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll get some more of this in time. Making up all these little sanding tools, by the way, is a big part. I know one of the things a lot of people don't have a real good concept of is is how to sand with tools. They want to do everything with their fingers and their hands and everything. We're going to need that little dowel, and I'll show that on a close-up. We're also going to need, I can just put the rest of this away, we're also going to need what amounts to be a little flat block like the Bob Martens blocks, and we're going to need some, I like to do this with 220. Remember, I'm going to knock the edges down with 220, and then what I'm going to do is go back after they have dope on them and do them with 320 or 400 or whatever. This will certainly be good enough for right now. Those are the two tools we're going to use. Now nothing fancy here, and of course you could improvise, you could use, actually one of the things you can use, I noticed, the handle of a, a number 26 blade, if you want a little smaller radius. If you really want to be a rocket scientist, you can go out and buy one piece of brass tubing of every size SIG cells, so that you can then make this little sanding tool for each uh, each radius that you think you're going to need. You also want to have something like this. This has the reverse draft angle on it for getting in corners. And of course, the idea, the reason you don't glue the sandpaper to this at this time, and you can use, I'm just showing this as an example, this is a piece of 150, I'll, I'll use 220. If you have the sticky back, what's nice is it'll kind of stick like that, and then after some amount of time, what you want to do is just move it over just a little bit because what will happen is you're wearing the edges out. So that's another tool we would like to have. And these are real handy. These are, if I remember right, the Bob Martens tools. You can make this a piece of eighth inch plywood and just take some 220. Again, leave it a little oversized. Grip it and now you're gripping sandpaper so you get a nice grip. And also now, as soon as you sand for X amount of time, you wear out the corners. You really never wear the middle of the sandpaper out. This is a real handy. So with those three tools, what we want to do is go over to the wing and let's get started. You know, what it is we're trying to accomplish, even if you go back as far as the Nobler video, an old built up wing of which any built up wing would actually be fine to use as an example. 
If you're doing foam wings, this is not really a technique you'll need to use a lot, but most of us at some point in time want to, for whatever reason, aesthetic reason, lightness, or just to go back and nostalgically build an old D-tube wing or an I-beamer. This would work on an I-beamer or whatever. Is all of these edges, if you, if you were to look at this wing from the front, and this edge is going to be like a razor blade. What we need to do is turn every one of those edges into a radius so that the silk span then can just flow out. It's going to shrink and bow just slightly if you notice, but if it bows off of that edge, if you have that razor edge and that silk span goes there, you're going to almost certainly rip the silk span. You're going to have a crack in the edge that as soon as you hit this with sandpaper, boop, the edge comes up. And then you wind up, remember that thing we're talking about filler, you'll wind up doing this, burying this whole thing in filler, and your wing will start to look like that. And all this is, of course, unnecessary weight. So we're going to make a real special effort at every, every edge where silk span ends and wood begins, every one of these edges. And especially in the corners where Joe has, we have the radius edge, that's where we need the round tube in that edge, is to transition very carefully into a radius edge. You don't want to have this transition in smooth and now all of a sudden it's rough and then up. So you need that tool to maintain a nice smooth edge, a nice transition in from all sides. Then obviously the first coat of clear that we put on here, the edges will swell. We'll need to go back and just dress these off just a little bit. And of course that'll just be a one or two swipe thing. And the third time maybe just kiss them again. But we want to have every edge be a nice radius. And that'll, that'll give us those beautiful open bays where everything looks like, I don't know even know how to describe it, like waves on a boat. And open bay wings reflect the light from every angle. Almost every angle you look at it, there'll be light facing back at you. So of course, so do I-beam wings. So the, one of the characteristics you get with an open bay wing is you get that real diamondy look. Every angle that it looks at, the sun is shining off it, and it looks beautiful to me anyway. And of course, it's the nostalgic way to build for old farts like us. <laughs> it's like going back and reliving your childhood. Now what I like to do is the first thing is get my tool and I can hold it like this and I can just kiss these edges off. You can't really hit them hard because a lot of it is end grain. I like to start in all the corners. Again, this is, this is 150 grit so I really just can very gently get the transition where that sheeting joint is. Just a little bit of technique here, and boy, once you get this, you'll have those beautiful edges. Remember old Jim Silhavy, boy, some of the edges he had. Bob Gildini, Stingray, beautifully finished model. You need to just kiss these at about a 45 degree angle. Now here you know it's end grain, so it's going to be a little bit, be very gentle. And remember, your hand will be more sensitive than your eye. And of course, the edge of, most important, the edge of the cap strip. Get right into the corner. Takes a few passes. Again, this is one of those time-consuming things. We have time. I'd like to get it real nice at this point in time. And then the last test, just feel what the silk span is going to feel. Now right here I see I have a high spot. And right here I have an edge. Your finger doesn't lie. If you can feel it with your finger, the silk span will feel it too. Again, this will usually start out first couple bays will take you longer than you expect and pretty soon you're doing these in your sleep. Okay that should be a good one and we could move on now. Obviously the square ones all we need is the square pad.
Now I just do a final check. Use your finger for the final check. And one little spot up here. Any little spot. Actually with a where the glue drips down onto the sheeting here, there's a little rough edge. Any spot you find right now, saving yourself a lot of filler, a lot of sanding, and a lot of work. Like building a house, build a good foundation, good substrate. There's a little spot right there. Too. All right, I'll do the rest of this off camera just to speed things up. We have a whole nother wing to do. Lucky us. Now the last thing I'm going to be able to do today is I want to very carefully, I got 320 and a foam block, I just want to dress all the wood off so the wood has a, a nice smooth, get all the hairs off its surface. We got the 220 to get all the shapes, everything is shaped properly. The 320 will just give everything a velvety smooth and I'll just work the whole wing out here. I guess I have about another hour here I can kill. Put about a half hour into each wing as far as just getting a, a nice velvety smooth feel. Up around the edges where we have the CA. Now you see after they're dried and that's CA'd a few times, once you go through the CA just redo it and you'll build up a little a nice rock hard edge there with just the right radius. You can actually follow into all the cap strip areas here with the 320. Just pat each thing down. Now, like I said, I like to get a lot of this sanding done early on in the program. Tomorrow we'll get down here and I guess we can start working on our wing tips, get the tips installed, get those final sanded in. Starting to shape up. At this point in time, it starts to every day that goes by, you see some progress, so it really is kind of rewarding. But if you pay, pay up front, get all this stuff sanded velvety smooth and blocked down, boy, when you put that first coat of dope on, it looks beautiful. Now that's about all I'm going to get done here. These are all all final sanded out with 320. All the edges are taken care of and we'll get back down here tomorrow and do some work with the tips. Now in this session, one of the things I want to do I have the tips that Joe has already prefabbed. Of course, one is blue. This is the blue wing I'm working on now. One is green. I'll show this real quickly. If you haven't seen how, uh, well, just typical of how we build, I guess over the last 10 years, build tip weight boxes with a screw that holds the weights. It'd be nice if I had some fingernails here, I could get this off. If you've never seen one of these tip weight boxes up close, I'll show it up close and of course many, many of the other videos including the uh, wing construction and cardinal construction and tweener construction, they all show how to make a tip weight box. I think it really would be redundant or if you've missed it you can just borrow one of those videos, steal one, whatever. We have this real nicely made tip weight box. I want to take this apart, show this on a close-up before we actually install it. And what we'll try to get done today is to get this installed. Maybe if we're real lucky, let's see what Joe did. A couple of little quick, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is as we go through on this video series, put down with each respective step pretty much all the things that I've learned in doing this, and this is going to be 43 years, I guess that's a long time to be doing this. I still can't get an Allen wrench into an Allen screw. Anyway, I'll take this apart. Outboard tip, a couple of general rules. You don't have to make the outboard tip super light. You could actually build in some of the weight ahead of time if you wanted to. I notice he's got this nice and solid. And I'll show this real close. One of the reasons is, and maybe it's easier for me to do this on a, on a piece of sketch paper, is when you build the tip weight box, if let's say you're shooting for making a 15 ounce wing and a tip weight box already weighs an ounce, 
Well, when you balance the wing on center, whatever the difference is, be like a seesaw, that the aggregate weight that's on that tip already doesn't count in the real wing construction. Maybe it's easier to show this on a piece of paper. I didn't anticipate doing it, but it's an important concept because, let's face it, and I won't mention any names, somebody made a nice 132nd balsa wood tip weight box so that they could get their total wing down about an ounce lower than mine at one time. Oh, my wing's an ounce lower than you. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, first flight, first wing over the tip weight and half of the tip went flying off into the parking lot. True story. You don't need a lightweight tip. In fact, I see Joe didn't even hollow this out. I don't think we're going to hollow it out. I'm going to put this on just the way it is. You almost never trim a plane out that you have no tip weight in it. It's just not a realistic thing. An equal span plane will always carry more tip weight than a plane with a bigger inboard wing, like a Thunderbird or a Smoothie. The reason I prefer planes with equal span, equal flaps, and equal pretty much everything, the reason is I like the extra feel, especially above 45 degrees of the tip weight, especially in the overhead eight. Some of the planes that I've made the wing a half inch bigger, a la Paul Walker, seem like there's some kind of a compromise in between but the best of all worlds, even my old 87 Noble or Red Noble, equal span, a lot of tip weight, nice solid line tension, and not to make yourself crazy making a lightweight tip weight box. Let me show this up close. Again, there's no reason to worry about it. If you really need to see how one of these goes together, it's kind of a, an easy thing. You have the screw that should be able to hold at least two ounces, two and a half ounces, maybe even three of tip weight. That piece will just clamshell right on there. Any the other thing we'd like to have is, of course, the hatch, and of course I have it backwards. The hatch that bolts right on. So you have the three, actually the three piece. Both of these are already prefab, so the next step for me is going to be simply go and put them on the wing, get them in position, get them on the wing. It would be really ridiculous to hollow this out and then have weight here, so I'm just guessing there's no point in hollowing anything here, unless unless what you try. I'm going to put that on a sketch pad, maybe that's a good thing for you to understand. Now actually some of the feedback I've gotten from people on these videos, one of the things is how much they appreciate seeing things laid out in detail like this with the sketch pad. I find this to be, uh, if nothing else, a handy way to, to explain something. All right, the whole thing here is, you want to build a wing. This would be the front view of the wing. The wing is in silver. It's ready to put in a plane at some point in time. The lead outs are already bent. You really can't do this to the lead outs are bent. You have your tip weight box in position. And you know this is the accurate center of the wing. What you can do is take this wing and balance it on Pencil erasers work fine, those pencil erasers. And you can put a grain scale either here, or in some cases this tip will be heavier. And you can let this drop and like a seesaw this will want to go down and it will record X amount of weight. Now let's say for instance that this weight is, uh, is 28 grains. That means this tip is heavier already than this tip if you reference off the center by by a roughly an ounce. Well, anybody can figure out if this if this was a 16 ounce wing, what it means is you already have one ounce of tip weight in. It's really a 15 ounce wing. And I, of course the opposite is true. If this side was an ounce heavier, if you had built yourself some kind of super heavy inboard tip or whatever, this 16 ounce would be a real 17 ounce because you would need to carry an extra ounce of tip weight here just to bring you back to ground zero. So having this concept in mind we can go on, glue the tips on, knowing the wing will probably come out a little bit heavier if you have a heavy tip weight box, the total weight of the wing, but in the final analysis when you go to fly the plane that ounce of imbalance will already count as tip weight and therefore you can deduct it right off the weight of the wing. Now don't trick yourself, don't get suckered in. The first thing I want to do, I want to make sure the tip weight box, the hatch cover is installed. Get the screw down nice and tight because this will set all the alignments. And I see he's got nice little center lines on here. This will set all my alignments so that the cover, we're actually using the cover 
to get this piece in position because obviously you wouldn't want to have this all so there's too much clearance here and none here so by setting the clearance there now what I can do is just carefully get all the clearances set and I can pretty much eyeball them if I want to be fancy I can use a razor blade it's roughly the thickness of a razor I'd like to have around the whole thing that's a little sloppy that's a little tight so why don't I be fancy Joe will be impressed Joe I'm doing this just for you okay the razor blades hold it in good alignment get some thin CA and just tack it together let the sanding dust kick it off make sure it's tacked in good position before we go around the whole edge now once I get this in position I'll want to do with the CA around the whole edge I have the leading edge done I have the trailing edge done I want to do this whole piece okay we can take the razors out now it's held in position the box is in good shape now I can go right around it do a little bit at a time always when you do this the sanding dust helps kick it off leave a little layer of dust on Now, like a tip like Strago or on a Cardinal it's exactly the same except the shape is different no difference at all and these tip weight boxes are dead reliable you never see one go flying off into the parking lot killing a judge or anything okay now that it's all put together I can take the hatch out and I'll see 80 inside that hatch I'm using as a locator Now, of course, I'll want to get CA down in here, get this all night. Ooh, that's smoking away. Get the CA all up along the edge. It'll make a nice hard edge that I can work off. I see Joe's got plywood on one edge already. Phew, this stuff stinks. It'll also fuel proof it. It'll also add a little bit of extra weight means we'll probably need less lead. Now that's a good time to get a Q-tips because you don't want any glue build up on the ledge there. Okay, that's nice and solid. Now I also want to take, same thing with this piece, the CA hardens up the edge. And of course I have to do this, I'll do one on camera and then go do the other one off camera. I'm trying to keep up again so both wings are in exactly the same state of completion. Kind of neat working on two planes at once. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, being in business or something. Okay, I'll just let this kick off. And once it kicks, I like to get all my edges back. Again, let the CA harden it up. And then all of the edges, just dress them. Get a little radius built in as soon as possible so you can start building up that real smooth radius. It really looks nice in the final finish when all the radiuses just match up. This side here I want the part that's going up against the tip. Get a nice flat surface. And of course the same thing on the tip here. I know what I always prefer to do is because this this fit Joe left this and rightfully so just a little bit oversized you want to make sure you have the same amount of overage on each side and I have a piece of tape just holding it in place make sure all along the whole length I have that same overage then I can take the thin CA tack it in position front and back It's starting to look like a Spitfire already. Now with the front and back just tacked in position, I want to make sure I have a nice straight joint along the whole thing. 
And of course this wood is just a little bit thicker here, just a little bit, so it gives us a little working room. Now I can tack it in a few other spots so I get a nice tight joint. As soon as that kicks I can flip it, do the same thing on this side. Once that dries up, I can pull a tape, I'll lose the tape here, check that everything is in good alignment. Now I can basically just run a bead on the hole, let's get rid of this glue tip. And then the last thing will be to final sand this in position. Of course, take a towel or Q-tips. Get rid of all the extra. It's really starting to look like a Spitfire now. Hey, Joe, you're all right. I don't care what Damarill says about you. Now, before I go sanding this in, get this nice and tight. Put the hatch back, I'll sand it in position with the hatch right in position just like the gear blocks, leave it right in position. Spitfires, I can hear Adam Luke's going now. Okay, that's ready to sand out. Now, you just can see that how much he left here, He's, it's the thickness maybe of a fingernail bigger. And that'll be ready to carve and sand in. Well, don't even have to carve it, just sand it right in. Now, always try to get this radius first. Where this radius joins this one, and where the back one joins, a nice long sanding block to get all these curved transitions. I want a straight line plane, these are less well, it's critical I guess is the right word, but on this one if any of these curves don't match up, we're going to look like the stupid fire instead of the spit fire here. That's why you want to use if possible the longest sanding block you can get to transition these curves in. And then I want to take and start at the front and start knocking it. This block is just a little bigger than this one. Start knocking it down and blending it in. Now I'm looking at it constantly right from the front to see if I get that smooth transition. I don't want it to go out and go Try to connect the dots in any curved surface. Now when you get almost there, then you're probably going to want to take the long block. Make sure you don't have a high spot and you can run that right out over the rest. We want this all to come into one area here. But <clears throat> I'm breathing this stuff in today. The last thing I like to do is with a piece of 320. Just dress off all the edges and we'll hit them with CA. <coughs> oh boy, oh boy. Mm -hmm. Have another cigarette. Keeping these edges nice and hard is just one of the secrets of getting that real nice razor edge on everything. 
and you have to go right starting now and all through the finishing thing of constantly radius in that edge constantly so when you're all done you, you can't get that edge on in the last coat of clear that edge has to be built right in right from the start obviously the edge of the rudder the edge of the flaps everything that has an edge if you harden it up with CA give it a little wipe that'll help you minimize the sanding just let that kick off and it will hit it again and any little any little imperfections we still have here and I see one in the wood there's a knot in the wood Get a little dap right there, there's a little knot in the wood, put some dap there. And you can finish off this with a nice little block and some 320, and you'll really start to build that edge, that nice curve into it. Because ultimately that's going to be the thing that really separates this model from, uh, you know, a traditional straight line stunner. All the curves, and this model is just full of curves. And exercise in curves. But if you get used to this early on, getting those edges nice, boy oh boy, later on in a finish, a couple of, sli a couple of swipes with the sandpaper and a sucker looks beautiful. So what I'll do, I'll do it off camera, I'll just do the green wing tip. I'm breathing so much of this stuff and I'm going to try to get outside and sand outside today if I can. Oh, what a job. I'm glad that's done. Outboard tips tomorrow. I'm still, you know, I've only got about three flights on it, so I really don't have too much going on about it. All right, to show you pictures on the video here, first tell everybody who you are. Bobby these, Jones. These, these go out worldwide. Now, this man's wanted by the FBI. <laughs> Drives all the way up here from Georgia or wherever he's, the hell he's, he lives. He's right here to get me. <laughs> okay, let me get this. Tell me about the model here. I'll put these on. It's uh, redesigned Miss BJ with a 53-inch wingspan, true 40 size. And uh, it's got a longer tail moment than the original, and uh, it's got larger flaps and stab and uh, elevators and rudder. And uh, it seems to be flying pretty good. Uh, real slow. It flies a lot like my modified Mangum. Is that good or bad? It's good. Except yeah, the, looks the nice. modified. The See force. what's nice about video? No yeah. problem. You want how many copies? You want 2,000? <laughs> <laughs> None of this go to the store, one hour photo stuff. Remember the red, white, and blue uh, force one I sent you a picture of? Yeah, yeah. You got any other pictures with you? We'll no, stick I just, them all I just brought those. I was looking for my pictures, but we had to leave oh, suddenly okay. because of the death in the family. And uh, I put them up somewhere where I wouldn't look. Now, tonight's project, Carlos is scrapping the original fuselage he made here. Not happy with it. And he actually wanted to abandon a 51 and go for a 60, so. We're making them up a new fuselage here. Who's winning on the uh, that buffalo? Forget about it. Where's the crutch? In the vice still? He He's still got the money. blocks all carved up here. And there's a nice crutch sitting out there, sitting right in the vice. So we're in Fat City here. It's a good night. Now we had a really good session last night, really good session. And this is one of the things, Rich Peabody was over later on in the night, he brought me over this copy of the Atlantic Flyer paper. Picture of Strega on the cover and of course uh, Banjok had told us that at the, the Circle Burner contest. There's some nice pictures of the air racers in here, in fact I got two copies of this mag, I got two different magazines here. Uh, just want to show the pictures real quick. These are nice, I hope you don't mind sharing them. And of course, here's our, here's our favorite, Strega. I'll just read the caption. The winner is Strega, Bill DeStefani's distinctive red and white P-51 
snatched an unlimited gold first place from last year's winner, Rare Bear. There's some other nice pictures here. Just gonna go through this real quick. I know most people out there, as well as Spitfires, we love these Reno Air Racers. And what a great collection it, it is to make these and have them and hey, it's nice just having them. It's just, just having them sitting on a shelf up there. Uh, I don't know, just love them. That's all there is to it. Like my wife, I just love her. I don't know why. She doesn't know why. Now, a friend of mine, John Pothier, has been helping me reorganize and update the catalog for a 96 edition. And one of the things he requested was some pictures that he could put in the catalog. And I thought, hey, let's get all the Reno Air Racers out here at once. The last of the, uh, looks like the last of the decent weather here. So what I did, I wound up doing a photo shoot this morning, pretty much killing off the morning. Get the three, I just couldn't resist putting some of this on the video, getting the three air racers out here. You know what's funny, when you think about what a person could do with his life, you know, when you think of all the things you possibly could do with your life, <laughs> having all these three guys out here at the same time, in front of the new shop. Now the next step in a Spitfire project is I'm looking at this line guide here. Now Joe originally made this so it has, and I'm going to have to think about this a little bit. I, I would rather be able to adjust each lead out individually. And I also, he is anticipating gluing this into the wing tip. And that would mean the lead out guide is three inches from the edge. I'm going to try to figure a way I can get this lead out guide further into the tip. So. A little bit of engineering is in order here, and uh, I'm going to look at what the possibilities are. Now we know, and, and I want to just put this information on here, we know that a typical pattern master, and of course we're trying to make this as much like a pattern master, relative to the hinge line we want to be able to move it back to about six and a half or as far forward possibly as we can get it or eight whichever comes first now one of the things I noticed when I measured this all out because we have elliptical tips and we're we're restrained in how far forward we can go we're really not going to be able to get it to eight inches we're probably going to get it maybe lose a half an inch but I want to make this that at least I can get as much travel as possible and the reason I'm going to change this is the way this tip is situated, I don't want to have the lead out guide, this would be a full three inches away. I'm trying to bury the guide so I did a lot of grinding and filing here on the first one just to see what this would look like. Get this as far into the tip as possible. I'm also going to take the slot that Joe has already cut, line this with 64th, I'll put this all on the video of course line this with 64th plywood but we'll really only be maybe an inch and a half away now of course it'll be a lot easier to get in and adjust it that way and I think it'll be a lot better of a system it won't be putting wear and tear on that piece of plywood in the wingtip more of the load will be generated in here also very important he used to make lead out guides and this is the way Joe made this one up and uh, of course I'm not not saying this wouldn't work I'm just saying a better system would be We'd like to get the bolt and the blind nut as close as possible and have each line individually adjustable. And it just happens that Strega is one of those situations where I always was able to find a good sweet spot for the down line, but the up line always wanted to go a little further forward or back according to conditions and whatever else I ran into. So I really think this is the better of the system. I'm going to be willing to, uh, you know, sc pretty much scrap that lead out guide and make up my own. Get it in here, or maybe I can just modify it. Get it as close into the wing tip as possible and have it so each one is adjustable. And I think it'll be, it'll take an extra, maybe an extra day to do this. But I think over the, well, two days if I do Joe's. But over the life of the plane, it'll be nicer having the adjustability. It'll be, it'll be a better engineering thing having it closer out. Of course, if we had square wing tips,
the closer you can get the guide, like on Strega tips, you'd like to get the guide buried as close in here as possible. When you have cardinal tips, well, yeah, you got to kind of bury it in here. One thing never do is put the lead-out guide on an angle, because what happens, the tubes have, uh, the lead-outs do that and come through the tubes, and I've seen guys, especially flexible lead-outs, wear out in 20 flights when they make a bend through the tube. Always want to make sure you parallel as close to the tip as possible. Try to give yourself the pre-programmed in a much a amount of adjustability. And a way to figure this out if you're designing your own plane, the mean average chord, of course, and then take 15% of it and take 20% of it. And I don't think realistically many people go behind 20% without, uh, without being some, some super duper crack a pot, you know, whatever you want to call it, stunt flyer. This is the range in which most people, most even good flyers, I wind up in this range all the time. Probably 18%, 17 whatever. Mike Rogers likes to go to 13. We had Strega to 12 and 7 eighths. But you can figure where that position is relative to the hinge line and the furthest forward. And of course, it's the mean average that you're worried about. You're not interested where up is and where down is. You want to know where the mean average of the two leadouts is. So what happens if you move the front lead out forward, the mean average changes because it's riding off of that mean average. Another thing too, I don't like to have the lead out so close together, and I see some people make one lead out a lot longer. I don't like that either. That adds drag, I think, that you don't really need having one line clip a foot from the plane. I like to get them about the most an inch apart, maybe three quarters, just so the line spacing is enough that the clips aren't rubbing. I have never found this to be a problem yet though. Three quarters of an inch seems to be fine, so with all that in mind, Let's see if we can grind away at this lead out and come up with something that will work in all these areas. Now what I did, I took the original one, I took the pieces off, and what I want to do is I measured up the thickness, I'll use Joe's thickness, because if you make it any thicker than this, it doesn't go all the way to the ends, and what I'm going to do is make up brand new pieces, so I'll make all four of them at once right in a piece of eighth inch plywood. Of course this is just one to paint in the next of doing a uh, an elliptical wing plane. There's a labor you know intensive area here. All of these curves and tips just consume a lot of time. And a lot of people, you know the people out there that don't appreciate it, well now what I want to do, I want to mic up a blind nut and get a drill for the blind nut and a drill for the brass eyelet that are a tight fit. 110 for the eyelet, 142 for the blind nut. Because I want these to be a nice tight press fit. There's nothing nothing funnier, nothing worse than in the middle of flying. And this happened to me, by the way, in the 91. The screw, we loosened it up and it kind of got stuck or whatever, and the nut fell into the wing. Of course, everything was getting sloppy by then. The plane was a few years old, so I want to make these, especially if this happens to Joe, he'll kill me. I'll be dead. So, okay, so I want to get nice, a nice tight uh, fit on a drill number one. Turn them upside down. I'll find one of my tools here and just set them in here so they're spread on both ends. You would think they would not come out this way. Anything with a reverse curve can flute them right out. Let's see what you can do is you can take take a drill. Some of the drills have a reverse angle. I don't know. Some do, some don't. And you can use that to, to peen over to flare out the opposite end of the eyelet. This way, even if the glue joint lets go of that eyelet, if the glue loosens up and that eyelet slides into the wing, you're in trouble. You've got to cut the plane. It's a pain in the ass. So this is cheap insurance. And 
I have a little tiny hammer, but actually in reality you could use a bigger hammer. Don't feel bad about beating up one of your good drills. This falls into the wing. Or even worse, if Joe's were to fall into the wing, I know I'd never hear the end of it, so. Cheap life insurance. All this does is peen it over, reverse flute it. And then we'll drill. Get a nice uh, drill for the blind nuts. And get the blind nuts as close to the eyelets as possible. This way we can get the tightest possible spread. All these are little redundancies. You think, you think this stuff is overkill until you have a little problem. Let's see if we can shove this up closer. Get on a macro lens here. Let's see, it's peened over on the back. Like a shoe, like the thing where your shoelaces go. Actually, I have a Stimson press outside for the, uh, the eyelets that go in the horns, but I just, I don't want to put a press on here and then squeeze the plywood. I think it'll destroy the plywood. So this is a good way. It's a good technique to use. All right, now we're going to get a hole drilled in here as close as possible, and then with the drill that fits the blind nuts, and then to get these married up. Obviously I'll glue these too, but I still want that nice tight press fit. They got a nice smearing of glue on this on both sides. And all that's left, I'm going to cut this out on a jigsaw and we're ready to go. Just take and dress these with the Dremel tool so they're, they're nice and workmanlike and get this side nice and flat and put a little bit of grease or oil in the blind nut so we don't wind up gluing this thing in place when we're installing it in the model. Now what you want to try to use if you can get them, these are for pop rivets. The washers, they're called fender washers, they're 5 8 You don't want to use the washers that come with if you're going to make your own lead out guide here. You don't want to use the ones that come with uh, the SIG nuts, they're too small. You also want to have the next smaller size eyelet to press in, that keeps it from rotating. That presses right in there now, it's a nice tight fit. Keeps it from rotating when you tighten the, the uh, bolt. Now we'll put the rest of this together and then we've got to start seeing if we can get it to fit right in the, uh, well we get the other one in. So it fits right in the, uh, the wing cavity. I want to get that out closer to the tip. Now, of course, I shorten up the screw. I only want to have maybe a sixteenth of an inch sticking out. And I put a little bit of that chain lube on here. You can see it's still on the washer. So that it slides back nice. And when we glue it into the wing tip, I, it keeps it from letting some run in there and lock it right into the wing tip. I've seen guys do that, or hey, I've been one of them, so. <laughs> okay, with a little bit of that PJ1, that chain lube on there. I don't want to make these overly tight. Obviously, one of the things you want to check for is that everything slides back and forth nice you have all the range of adjustment now what I'm doing is several ways of putting these on you obviously could put it so that the screws are at the outside the inside but because I lost some of my forward clearance I want to have these that the line the forward line will go as far forward as possible when I lock that in I can get as much forward clearance as possible 
Now you can see this doesn't fit very far in here, so what I'm going to do is let it just drop in as far as it'll go. And I'm going to start dremeling away on one side, dremel away, and on the other side file a leadout guide till that leadout guide drops all the way in. Now this is the original shape that Joe made up. I'll run over and grind some of this down little by little. Okay, and with that grinding, now the next step is you can see that just a little dry fit, it goes about more than halfway in right now. Now I'll mark this with a pen and then just chisel away with an X-Acto knife and a Dremel tool so that'll go to last maybe eighth of an inch down into the tip. Now the pen just lets you find a spot where it's hitting, like it's hard, like, just like when you do sheetrock work, the hard spot where it's hitting, and I can run and cut that right out. Now you can see where the hard spot is, so what I want to do is just shave that out on both sides, so this will go even further into the tip. You see what that piece done now, this will slide even further into the wing tip than original. Okay, but the next step I want to do is I want to cut a little piece of plywood for this edge. I don't want to uh, just leave the balsa with there. This will clamshell together. I want to trace out a little piece of plywood here. I want the grain to go front to back if possible. This is 64th plywood and I can drop this in here. Get it exactly where I want it. Just turn it over and trace it. This gives a nice edge, and you can see even on Strega and on other models that the edge where the leadouts are, if you slip with the wrench a little, you don't ruin the whole piece. And of course, then just get it rough. And we'll make two of them. I just want to dry fit this in place. I want to let it hang out just a little bit. I'll block sand that in using that for the edge. Alright, that's ready. I can glue that right in. Now I like to tack glue this up first. Just let the tack sit. Got a nice true surface on that. And it's ready to drop the guide in. I like to just dress that edge off, that 64 plywood edge. We're almost at the end of this tape, so I think we're going to have to pick up the installation of this on the next tape. Just dress this off, and it's, it's that nice edge. You get in there with a wrench, and you don't chew that all up halfway into the, you know, the life of the plane. Okay, you can see how nice that went in there. That really was a, a good deal. What's a good idea too is before we put this on a tip, get this all as as close to being sanded as possible. We get this put on a tip, and we'll pick this up on the next tape. Now we're going to pick this up on the next tape here. Just doing a little dry fit in here. Making sure it's still a Spitfire. Didn't turn into a Nobla while we were out to lunch. Boy, I just love laying this out at the end of the day and just looking at it. Oh, sexy wing, Joe. I got to give you credit. 
Joe gets all the credit for this wing boy. He spent a lot of hours with the French curve getting this all right. And it's a spitfire. See you on the next tape.